Good afternoon. It's good to see you. Uh, this Friday, you know what day this is this Friday? What day is it? Your birthday? I don't think so. Is it your birthday? No way. I'm going to ask your mother. Um, come on, this Friday. What is this Friday? Christmas Day. Okay, Christmas Day. Actually, I do know somebody that's born on Christmas Day. Uh, somebody special. Uh, uh, but that's a different story, actually. She has a wonderful testimony. But this Friday is Christmas. It's Christmas Day, and it's the, it's the day when Christians around the world celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, actually, we know from history that Jesus was not born on December the 25th, but traditionally it's the day that Christians around the world remember his birth. Unfortunately, for, uh, for many of the developed countries of the world, the actual meaning of Christmas is, is steadily uh, being lost, particularly the religious side of things. More and more people focus upon who? Who's the guy in the red suit that I saw? I went to Seoul on Friday, and every Chia Choyok, every every subway stop, there was a, there was Santas, and there was people advertising for restaurants, and it's, I saw Santa everywhere. Kind of the skinny Santa Claus, I'll add. Uh, Koreans don't make a good Santa, I don't think, but. But, but peop, the, the children today know more about the historical life of Santa than they actually know about the, the life, of, life of Jesus. Actually, again, Santa Claus, actually a, more of a fictional character. There was a person called, called Nicholas many, many uh, hundreds of years ago. But uh, the kids nowadays, they can tell you just like that all about Santa. But what about the birth of Christ? In America, for instance, 80% of Americans uh, call themselves Christians, and yet it seems like year by year that the religious aspect of Christ is being uh, of Christmas is being downplayed. In fact, uh, many of our leaders in America, and they 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 are trying to almost remove the the uh, public expression of the religious side of Christmas. Uh, uh, in in schools, kids are not encouraged to the traditional Christmas songs. That one of which we just sang. We are we. Uh, when I was a young person, we sang all those things. Now, in certain lo- locales, that uh, they're being discouraged because of the the name Christmas, Christmas Christ Mass, but it has the word of Christ. And so they're saying we well. Eighty percent of us may be Christians, but there's some that aren't. We don't want them to feel bad. We need to remove that from public life. In fact, more and more advertising the the major stores, instead of saying uh, Merry Christmas, they say what? Happy Holidays. They take the Christmas out of that. There was a bit of a controversy a, a few years ago with the U.S. Postal Service. There was actually a memo telling postal employees, do not wish anyone Merry Christmas. We, we want to take that word out of it. Uh, what is this, by the way, over here? What is this thing? Christmas tree? No, no, you're confused. It's a holiday tree, Paul. Okay, holiday tree. We don't want to offend anybody by saying Christmas tree. I watched a, com- a, con- a comedy movie a few years ago in the Christmas, actually they call them Christmas movies, but those are some of the most popular. But there was a, there's one that came out a few years ago in 2004. It had Tim Allen and uh, I can't think of the other, the actress's name in it, uh, Curtis. What's her name? Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, it was terrible because the producers of this film just went out of their way to remove every reference whatsoever to actual anything to do with the religious side of Christmas. Christmas was portrayed as merely Santa Claus and presents and what I'm going to give and the joy that's, that, that comes from giving presents and receiving presents. And yet they portrayed it as it's supposed to be this wonderful family time. It's supposed to be this time where we think of others, but they completely omitted any religious reference whatsoever. Well, again, in a country like America, where 80% of the people call themselves Christians, 
why are we allowing this? Why, why are people allowing that to be taken, to, to happen? Why is the, the actual meaning of Christmas being lost? The problem is, is that people have forget, forgotten why Jesus came. People have forgotten why Jesus came. In Korea, less than 30% of Koreans claim to be Christians. In fact, more than 50% claim to not to believe in God at all. So, the, so there's even more confusion about the religious side of Christmas, what it actually means. So this afternoon, I want to do something very, very basic. I just want to talk about around the theme, why Jesus came. Why Jesus came. And I made a bulletin insert, and it has several scriptures. Uh, it has several scriptures that I wish you would follow along as we look at these. And I want to talk about six reasons why Jesus came to earth and why Christmas is so meaningful. First, Jesus came to reveal God and accomplish his Father's will. And you can read in the bulletin insert there. Jesus said this in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was on a mission. When he came 2,000 years ago, in Bethlehem, he was on a mission. God Almighty had sent him. He sent him to reveal God to a lost creation. In John 1.18, it says this, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, the only begotten Son. That's a very special word in the Greek. It's monogene, mono, one Gene, to become one of a kind. Jesus was one of a kind. Jesus was totally unique. There'll never be another. He is a unique individual. The only begotten God who was in the bosom of the Father, talking about a relationship. In eternity past, this relationship, God the Father, God the Son, now he comes to earth to do what? It says he has explained him. Again, the word explain means to reveal, disclose, to, uh, to, uh, sh to uh, relate something that's not known. He has revealed him. He has disclosed him. Again, if you want to know God, you have to look at Jesus. That was his purpose. Jesus was totally committed to doing his Father's will. Every action, think about it, he is the, in a, according to Colossians, he, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Everything that he did, everything that he said revealed God. He came to fulfill his Father's will, and according to, uh, according to John 5.19 and 12.50, therefore he could correctly say in John 14.31, but that but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave commandment, even so I do. Did you hear, um, I, I did not know what Josiah's testimony was going to be, but did you hear one of the themes of his testimony? I was displeasing my parents. I wanted to, I felt bad because I was, I was uh, having, I was, my behavior was causing trouble in my relationship with my parents. And therefore, God convicted him. He wanted, to, he wanted to please his parents. Well, here Jesus was completely uh, committed to doing the will of God. And he says very plainly as a testimony himself, as a father gave commandment, even so I do. In other words, he was obedient to his father. So Jesus came. The first reason, Jesus came to reveal God and accomplish his Father's will. second reason, Jesus came. He came to serve and to sacrificially give his life. In a world that, where the rich and powerful dominate, here was the King of kings and the Lord of lords who came to earth and became a man. And what kind of a man? Where was he born? Give me some facts here. Where was he born? Talk to me. Hmm? Bethlehem. Oh, that's a major. You went to Seoul. That's like Seoul, right? They got KTX and they've got everything there, right? Bethlehem. Okay, northern Israel. Uh, where was he born, though? The hospital? He was born in the best hospital in Israel, right? No? 
Okay, Cha Young Mi, I gotta ask you, I'm gonna call on you. Where was he born? <laughs> He's born in a manger with animals. Born to who? Born to a teenage bride, to a teenage mother and a, and a father, and they were traveling. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he came and he lived a humble life. What was Joseph's what, what was Joseph's profession? What was his profession? Okay, carpenter. God became man and dwelt among us. He lived a humble life. How humble? Mark 10.45. So even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Really, to serve. How much did he serve? And to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was genuinely concerned for others. He was a servant leader. Ultimately, he would voluntarily what? Give his life, give up his life, die for the benefit of everyone else. In Jesus' time, the word ransom, the word ransom refers to the practice of actually buying freedom for a slave. In the ancient world, when Jesus uh, lived in Israel, of course, the Roman Empire was the dominant power of the time. Rome itself, probably the population of Rome, was 60% slave. Slavery was very, uh, was very much entrenched all across the world. And here the word ransom, it talks about the price paid so that the slave could become free. In other words, a slave was not a slave any longer. He was a free man. Jesus came to do, for, to do the absolutely unthinkable the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, became a man and willingly died so that you and I could be spiritually free. Amen? Jesus came to serve and sacrificially give his life. Third, he came to seek and to save. To seek and to save. Jesus explained in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth was to find and rescue those who were in trouble. In fact, at the time of his birth, the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph and said that Mary will have a son. And he said, you will name him Jesus. And the name Jesus means literally God saves. God saves when Jesus was dedicated after his birth, eight days later, according to the Jewish tradition, they went to the synagogue, and there they were going to dedicate him. And at the synagogue, there was an elderly man by the name of Simeon. And Simeon, years earlier, had received a, a word of prophecy from God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah, the Christ. And as, they, as Mary and Joseph came, and they brought baby Jesus. Simeon knew that that was the Messiah. He came and he held that baby eight days old. And he prayed to God like this. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, quoting the Old Testament, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and a glory of your people, Israel, Gentiles, Israel, Jewish people. Any, are there any Jewish people in here today? Any Jewish people? No? Well, I guess what? You're all Gentiles. Here is Jesus. He came to seek and to save the light uh, of revelation to the Gentiles. Jesus came to seek and save both Jews and Gentiles. And this is the reason that he says of himself in Luke, in, excuse me, in John 8, 12, in, in John 9, 5, he says of himself, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. What does light do for you? Huh? Before, Paul said, can you turn up the lights? I can't see back. What does light do for us? Come on, talk to me. Mary, talk to me. What's light do for us? I had time. Okay, we, in Korean schools, if, if the hak saying, if the students misbehave, they have to be punished. Okay, Mary, raise your hands like this. <laughs> Come on, what guys, what does light do for us? Helps us to see. 
Here, Jesus, I am the light of the world. How many people are on planet Earth right now? Hmm? 6.8 billion, maybe? Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. He's come to reveal God, spiritual truth. Number four, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3, 8, he says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The word devil, it means liar, false accuser. Satan has power over this world. Just pick up a newspaper. Pick up a newspaper and see what you read. What are the headlines? Satan has power over this world. Jesus calls him the ruler of this world in John 14, 30. The apostle Paul refers to Satan or the devil. He calls him, as, calls him the God of this world who confuses people so that they will not understand the gospel message. What's the word gospel mean? Good news. It's the good news. Gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. But Satan is there confusing, preventing people from understanding the truth. Jesus came to change all that. Satan was a constant enemy of Jesus. In fact, the name Satan means enemy, adversary. Satan tempted Jesus after his baptism and at other times as well. Luke 4.13 says this, When the devil had finished every temptation, talking of Jesus, he left him, he left Jesus until an opportune time. He's coming back. He's coming to tempt Jesus, to try to hinder his life, hinder his ministry. Satan was always looking for an opportunity to harm Jesus and disrupt his ministry. You know, a key point to remember is this, is that Satan uses people. Satan uses people to perform his, his evil work. Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. Three and a half years, his public ministry was just three and a half years. Yet for at least three years of that, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, they wanted to kill Jesus. And in fact, they made several attempts on his life. Eventually, his assassination, do you hear me? His, assass his assassination became the number one priority of that governmental system. Satan was successful in harming Jesus when he used Judas to betray him. Jesus did die on the cross, but he makes it clear that Satan did not have any power or influence over him. Jesus, what, voluntarily gave up his life. He made the choice to go to Calvary's cross and go through all that pain and torment and suffering in order to fulfill his heavenly Father's will, his Father's will. In fact, Jesus' death and resurrection, his death, three days, his resurrection, was actually, it actually marked the beginning of Satan's inevitable defeat. We will win one day. If you, know, if you know the scriptures, we're on the winning side. And Jesus, as he died and rose again from the dead, his sacrificial death and his bodily resurrection, it proved that everything that he said of himself was true, was real. If Jesus just died and he stayed dead, there would be, it wouldn't be any different than anyone else. However, the reality, the miracle, the resurrection proves that he was who he said he was that all his promises are true, and that eternal life was actually a reality. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil by exposing Satan's nature as a liar. Two scriptures that you can use to contrast uh, Satan and God. John 8.44. John 8.44. Again, I mentioned that Satan uses people. Here, Jesus, he is in a heated conflict with the religious leaders that are opposing him. And listen to what Jesus, we, we think of Jesus, meek and mild and kind. and, and all. But Folks, that's the, the same man took a cord and he made a whip. And inside the holy place, they had animals and they were exchanging money and they were doing 
And that same meek and mild man with a loud voice in a whip to do what? To intimidate and to, and to correct. In two times, he drove all those people out of the place where they should not be in the temple area. And here, Jesus is in a heated conflict with the religious leaders. And this is what he says in, in John eight forty four. He says this, You are of your, your father the devil. That won't make any friends if you try to say that to people. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Where, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When, G, when Satan speaks, he speaks a lie because that's a natural thing for him to do. That is what comes out. And yet you can contrast this to what Jesus prayed in John 17, 17. As he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for them and said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Satan, the world, lies. God's word, relationship with God, the truth. There couldn't be any more of a stark contrast than that. Jesus came to reveal, the, to reveal God and accomplish his Father's will. He came to seek, to, to serve and sacrificially give his life. He came to seek and to save. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And fifth, he came that, he, that you might have a more fulfilling life. Two weeks ago, I shared, uh, shared with you the story of Dao Kim about this model that, that took her own life beautiful young lady, only 20 years old, and there she goes in her apartment in Paris, and she hangs herself. And we use the scripture, John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that, that, that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Once Jesus destroys Satan's works, his evil influence in our lives becomes diminished. We can begin to enjoy the type of life that, with God that he originally intended. The thief is the one who tries to come and tries to deceive us, deceive, deceive us, turning or others, seeking to turn them from God's way, from God's purposes. He comes literally to steal and kill and destroy. These are the works of the devil. Even this week in America, there was a, f a fairly famous football player who was so distraught in his life in the back of a pickup truck. I don't know if you know what a pickup truck is. But on the back of a pickup truck with his fiance driving and probably going at a high rate of speed, it probably something like this. Either stop this truck or I'm going to jump out. In other words, I'm going to kill myself. And guess what? That's what that young man did. 26 years of age. That's what he did. That's the way father of three. That's the way he chose to end his life. That was the thought processes going through his mind. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy the contrast. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. The life we mentioned in Greek, Zoe, spiritual life, but also abundant life here on earth. When Jesus expose, exposes the devil's true nature, people learn to do what? Make better choices and avoid his schemes. Life becomes better naturally. Why? Because people are trying to live their lives according to God's truth. Jesus said in John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, who obeys them, who lives by them, who follows them, is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by, by my Father, and I will love him. You see this love triangle here. Me, Jesus, God, all in this loving obedience to one another. And I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. I will show him more. Ephesians 2.10, if you look at it, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Do you remember? 
good works. God did not put you down on this earth for 70 and 80 years of misery. He put you here so that you can have an abundant life, a meaningful life, a significant life. And also, finally, six, Jesus came to give you the gift of eternal life. Probably for, for anyone that grew up in church, the first verse of Scripture that they ever memorized is John 3.16. John 3.16. And I want you to repeat, repeat this after me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I remember uh, we had a family member. uh, My wife isn't here today. She has a very bad cold. But I remember one time where she's from Maine, and we we had a family reunion up there, and one of her sister-in-laws came up to me with just a very uh, non-religious person, and she came up to me with a very puzzled look and said, at American football games, the NFL, why... Why are there people in the crowd with signs that say John 3.16? Why do they do that? She wasn't religious, but she's wondering why. Well, it's because the message of the gospel is so concisely defined there. For God so loved the world. God, a personal God, loves, we say world, Korean, say sang. But it's more, we, we're not talking about rocks and trees. We're talking about humans. We can, relationships. For God so loved the world. You could, in fact, you can put your name there. You could put, for God so loved Che Young Mi. So, for, for God so loved Il Bin. For God so loved Robert Hale. He did what? That he gave his only begotten son, same word as in John 1.18, his one-of-a-kind son, his totally unique son, that whoever, hallelujah, whoever, young, old, doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter what gender, doesn't matter what nationality, whoever believes in him, trusts in him, should not, have, should not perish, but have what? What's it say? Everlasting life. In Korean, Yongsei. Everlasting life. Again, in John 17, verses 3 and 4, Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father, and he said, This is eternal life, that, you, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Notice that Jesus defines eternal life as both knowing God the Father and knowing God the Son. Friends, you cannot separate the two. Do you hear me? You cannot separate the two. People say, oh yes, I I, I believe in God. I'm a very spiritual person. When I was growing up in church... What my very, very best friend, in fact, we were in youth group. He was the strongest person either, uh, strongest person in our youth group. Very bright guy. Grew up, went to Ivy League school, became a lawyer, uh, became a, a producer, a film producer. Uh, in fact, today he's extremely wealthy. You may, some of you may be familiar with like the, the World Series of Poker. Poker, the poker tournaments. He's the one that invented that whole medium. He's probably he's got a company now. His company's public, uh, multimillionaire. I've seen interviews of I've seen interviews of him on the internet. The guy's a complete pagan now. His grandfather was a very influential Baptist minister. His great grandfather was a president of a denomination. In fact, there's a college there's a college that has his family's name on it and yet this guy now can barely even quote any scripture whatsoever and he calls himself a pagan and it breaks my heart but as i spoke to his mother one day and i cuz i haven't seen him in i haven't seen him in 30 years 
I spoke to his mother one day and I said, is Steve, does Steve go to church there in California? She said, no, but he's very, very spiritual. She was giving a mother's answer because she was embarrassed. He's very, very spiritual. Well, folks, spirituality is not eternal life. Being a religious is not eternal life. Jesus clearly defines it. This is eternal life. What? That they may know you, the only true God, true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. You cannot separate the two. He says, Jesus says that he has completely accomplished his mission that God gave him to do. And this is important but it, because it means that you and I can have a personal relationship with God that will never end. I used to teach a Bible class here, and we had a motto for our class, and the motto was this, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Say that with me. Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. That is the single defining point that, that makes the difference between Christianity and all the other religions of the world. That we can have a personal relationship with God. What kind of relationship? A loving relationship. A loving relationship that begins on this earth and that continues for all eternity. Now some of you may come out of a Buddhist or Hindu background. And your view is, your view is different. You view that maybe there may be uh, cycles, that maybe we exist in previous lifetimes. Well, friends, I want to tell you that is not accurate according to the scriptures. There, it is more linear. Yes, eternity past and then eternity future. But in the middle, we, we see where it's presented that God knew us before the foundation of the earth and at, the, at, his, at the time of his choosing, at the right time, we come and we exist and we live our lives and we stand before God. Again, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. My friend, I don't care how smart you are. Evolution is a total crock. If you think for one minute that you are a byproduct of some chance universe, you are sadly mistaken. God is a loving God. God is a creator that knows you, that loves you, that wants an intimate relationship with you. And he wants that relationship for all eternity. Your life is special. Your life has meaning and value. Again, you're not on this earth for 70 and 80 and 90 years of misery. You are on this earth to do God's will for your life, and God does have a special plan for your life. This is why Christmas Day 2,000 years is so important, because that original Christmas Day, God Almighty became a man. The Savior has come, and do you remember what the song the angels sang? They're saying, Hosanna, glory to God in the heart. It is a day of rejoicing. As we conclude, many people of the world, in fact most, they don't understand what the significance of Christmas is. We've talked about six reasons why Jesus came to earth and why Christmas is so meaningful. First, Jesus came to earth to reveal God and to accomplish his Father's will. And it's on our PowerPoint, we have the conclusion. Jesus came to reveal God and accomplish his Father's will. Jesus came to serve and sacrificially give his life. Third, Jesus came to seek and to save. Fourth, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Fifth, Jesus came that you might have a more fulfilling life. And, and lastly, six, Jesus came to give you the gift of eternal life. If we're going to summarize, and we have it on the screen, if I was going to summarize this, why did Jesus came? Why did Jesus come? Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. He came for you, Luke. He came for you, Paul. He came for you, Mr. Gunther. He came for you, Priya. He came for you, Mary. He came for you, young me. 
Jesus came for you. He came to show you who God is, to give you an example of sacrificial service, to pay the ransom for your spiritual freedom, to save you from sin, and to destroy the devil's influence in your life and replace it with his loving guidance. Finally, Christmas is so wonderful because Jesus came to forgive you of your sins and give you the gift of eternal life. Let's bow our heads.